think so, yeah. Don't start the clock until. I've done my hedgehoggery, as Lowell indicated, in some meetings in Washington, but today I'm going to be more foxy, sort of a foxy grandpa, because of a um, survey research project that I've been involved in and has a lot of data that I'm going to show you, which is very, very hard to get across in a 19-minute presentation, so I, uh, you forgive me in advance and I forgive you if you don't understand the data. Uh, the central puzzle that I want to address has to do with the fact that public support for the Chinese regime is very high, and I'm interested in whether that's partly due to political culture, and I can answer this question neatly in some aspects by using survey research, but as always with survey research, there are frustrations when the data are too complicated or don't give you a clear hedgehoggy answer to that question or, or where there are other things you'd like to know that they don't answer. So th this is the nature of my talk. It's a bit different from the others that we've had so far, but it has potentially implications for the bigger questions. First, I just want to tell you a little bit about where the data come from. They come from a survey project called the East Asia Barometer. I'll run through these slides rather quickly, where we did surveys in eight Asian countries in 2001 to 2003, and these are some of the features of this survey. It was a standardized survey instrument. It was coordinated by a guy we all know named Yunhan Chu. Uh, the uh, web address if you want to know more. There were eight countries that we surveyed. The web address? I, I want, no, I can't give it to you now. <laughs> it's, she's going to take it off my time. Uh, I'll give it to you later. There are eight countries in the survey. Five of them are new democracies, and that was kind of the core focus. We're interested in those new democracies. The other three societies provide a comparative benchmark. Those are the number of respondents that we sampled in each place, each one done by a survey team in that country. Um, the total number of cases in the data set is over 12,000. Face-to-face interviews conducted by students or different kinds of interviewers in the different places according to the practices of that team and about an hour-long questionnaire. The central focus of the project is not the topic I'm reporting on today about political culture and regime legitimacy, so I'm trying to use a survey you know, for a different purpose, which is legitimate and often done. The central focus within the project was around the concept of democratic consolidation, a concept uh, that uh, has been defined by a number of political scientists, Al Stepp and Juan Linz, but Larry Diamond of the Hoover Institution is a member of our project. And where's my, where does the light come out? Larry Diamond's idea of democratic consolidation kind of guided the project. So in order to study democratic consolidation, we've asked a number of batteries, the socio-demographic variables, social capital, and so forth, and among, uh, I will be using a number of these batteries in my analysis. And for political culture, we have two batteries in the questionnaire, traditional social values and democratic values, which I'll describe in a moment. And we plan on, we are now in, involved in a second wave of surveys. We've changed the name of the project from the East Asian Barometer to the Asian Barometer because there are now 17 countries involved in it, some of them in South Asia and in South, additional countries in Southeast Asia. This is located within an even larger thing called the Global Barometer Surveys, the Afro-Latino New Europe barometers. Okay, so let's get into some of the data. Regime support and democratic support. Here I'm interested in basically what we call legitimacy. 
which I define in an empirical way as the public supports the regime. Now, this is a uh, concept that the discipline of political science talks about a lot, but we haven't developed really good survey research questions to measure legitimacy. The top two questions on this table are really the best, I think, to get to that underlying concept. Our form of government is best for us, and I'm satisfied with the way democracy works in our country. I consider that as diffuse support for the regime because each and every one of these eight regimes calls itself a democracy, including the Chinese regime. So I think when you ask a respondent, are you satisfied with the way democracy works in our country, the answer that's coming back is around the area of what I'm calling diffuse regime support or legitimacy. The other questions in this table are interesting and they're in the questionnaire. I've given you the data, but they're not, they're, they're more uh, peripheral to the focus of my analysis and they have some comparative value. Does the person reject authoritarian? We ask the person, do you think we should, uh, if things got bad, should we blah, 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 have the military step in? We asked five such questions and you could get a score, the respondent. Uh, gets a score for how many of those he rejects. Similarly, we asked five questions about democracy. Do you think democracy is suitable? Is democracy desirable? Can democracy solve our, pro our problems? So that will get you the fourth measure uh, and so forth down the line. Now, one of the striking things here is that um, China scores so high. The average uh, of the Thailand scores very, very high. The Thais had gone through a democratic transition. They're, the public was extremely thrilled with it. Uh, Japan scores very low. Japan has had democracy since 1945. It's been a troubled thing, corruption and stagnation and this and that, and the Japanese public is generally quite critical. Uh, China is the second highest. Now this average down at the bottom where China has an 80.9 80, 80 doesn't really mean anything. It's just the, it happens to be the average of those countries. It doesn't mean much, but it does help me to lay the countries out in the table in a certain order. So that's in a way is my puzzle. Why are the Chinese saying 94.4% percent of them saying that our form of government is best for us in 81.7 are saying that they're satisfied with the way democracy works. Well, one answer to that question could be the performance of the regime. Like we like our regime when it performs well and we don't we like it less when it performs badly. Presidential approval, Chen Shui Bian's approval rating or something is not really support for the regime. By regime we're trying to look beyond the incumbent, but also beyond the society pride in China, for example, to look at the regime, you know, the, the, the uh, suite of institutions that they have. But nonetheless, the performance of that regime could be an answer. Now, we asked a series of questions, nine questions about, do you think that the current regime is doing better than the past regime with respect to corruption, with respect to accountability, with respect to economic growth? And when I boil all those down into a percentage differential index, so for example, the number 69.7 on Thailand is the percentage of people who say that the new regime is doing better minus the percent of people who say that the new regime is doing worse on the aggregate of five measures of democratic performance. So this is a very, very highly aggregated number that you're getting, and you, to really know what it means, you'd have to go through all the steps. But basically, the ties are saying that most of us think that our new regime's providing a lot more freedom and accountability than the old regime, which is true. That's quite realistic. They also think the ties that their new regime's doing a lot better on economic growth, anti-corruption, law and order. Where's China on this? China's kind of in the middle. The, Deng, the, the 2002 is when we did this regime is obviously doing much, much better on democratic performance. As somebody said in the morning panel, Bill Overholt than the Mao regime, which we asked them to compare it to. And they're, they're happy with economic performance, but not too happy with social equity and corruption. So the government gets a minus. So we see that in general across the region that the, the publics are rather realistic and that they're uh, 
rank order, if uh, you compare tables one and two, that the ties are the most positive to their regime. They also give it the highest democratic, the highest performance scores, and that the rank orders are quite similar, except for Japan, which has moved from the last in table one to the second in this table. But obviously, performance has something to do with support for the regime. But what about political culture? Well, we have two culture variables. As I said, are sweets, uh, uh, batteries of culture variables. One that attempts to measure social values. Uh, there's a long uh, intellectual history behind why we asked these nine questions, but uh, I don't have time to go into it. But we ask these nine questions, and we find out that, for example, the, high, the uppermost question, for the sake of the family, the individual should put his personal interest second, is widely believed throughout the region, even in the most modern societies. While the last question down below, a man should not work for a female supervisor, is not widely subscribed to throughout the reason, although I personally suspect that respondents didn't all tell us the truth because a lot of our interviewers were women. So, but I think that it, in general, the, the quality of answers, I should say, to the survey questions, I think, is high, but you know, it's not, uh, in this particular question, I'm suspicious. Uh, and that Hong Kong is the least traditional overall of all of these societies and Mongolia the most and China is the third from the most traditional measured by this very rough measure of an average. Well, this table is really fascinating and we could talk for a long time about each question and why it is the way it is and so forth, but I don't have time. <laughs> Tough. Okay, now we also had another battery on political values. This battery has been, uh, comes out of its own intellectual history, why we ask these particular questions. We don't, we were trying to find out the public's commitment to democratic values without using the word democracy. In many of our questions, we use the word democracy. Are you satisfied with the way democracy works in our country? Do you think democracy can fix the problems that we have. But here we purposely don't use that word and we make up other ways to ask about certain core democratic values. So the first question asks about the value of political equality and it's cast in such a way that if the respondent agrees with the proposition, we code that respondent as having a democratic value. And the second question, if he disagrees with it, we code him as having a democratic value. And so once again, we can or arrange the questions from the top to the bottom, the most to the least agreed to, as well as the countries. And here we see Japan, which was the last country in the first table where people were you know, dissatisfied with the regime, that the people there, uh, when you don't use the word democracy, but ask them about these core values, that they actually have the highest level of support for those core values, and China's uh, in the middle toward the uh, right-hand side of the table. So we got a picture for sort of the range of two sets of values. And now, if you ask how they're related, they are related. I don't have, not giving you this table, but if you correlate an, each individual's respondent score on the traditional and the democratic value scales, they are negatively correlated. The more people who believe more in democratic political values believe less in traditional social values and vice versa. That comes out here. In the left-hand panel, I've correlated each of the 12,200 people's uh, uh, score on the traditional and democratic values batteries with their education, income, urban versus rural residents, age group, and sex. And what you see here is that the signs are the opposite. So if you look in the upper left-hand cell, traditional values, it's a minus sign. Democratic values, it's a plus sign. It means that education works in a reverse way to impact the person's values. And all through the table, the signs are the reverse, which is you know, what we should expect, but it's a very satisfying finding <laughs> nonetheless. And what we're basically seeing is that uh, ed, you know, education, income, urban residents uh, make people uh, lose their traditional values and get more democratic values while age works in the opposite direction and sex when everything else is controlled for 
um, has, um, has some effect, but it isn't as marked. So I think it's true that men are less traditional and more pro-democratic in general, but that's because they are the ones to get the education, go to the city, and so forth. This whole suite of effects is mo most marked in the three Chinese societies. Uh, they stand out in that regard. These are universal effects, but their impact is more marked in the Chinese societies than in the others, and more marked in the five Confucian societies formerly Confucian, then in the others, and so forth. So it's an interesting pattern. I don't have time to go into the right-hand panel of this table, which is, by the way, on the web of the center, you know, so you can look it up and get all that stuff that you're missing now. But the impact of traditional and democratic values on other political attitudes is also there. Now, so if culture exists, which I would say is basically what I'm saying here, is that culture does exist. Uh, what is it, what, is, what, are, what are its, its effects? Well, this regression analysis suggests that the impact of culture on a behavioral uh, variable, which is electoral participation, voting, and mixed in with two other things, participating in election campaigns, exists, but it is not particularly marked. If you do a regression analysis and feed into it some of the other variables that you should feed into it that are available in the data set, they have some impact. So, for example, age group has an impact, positive impact, and fairly marked positive impact on electoral participation. Older people participate more. The impact of values is quite weak. It's there to some slight extent, but it's not very marked. So we might say culture exists, but it doesn't matter. Now here's the payoff table, which is incredibly complicated. It has, I couldn't fit it all onto one slide, so there's an upper slide and a lower slide, but let's focus in on the upper slide. Culture does matter for D regime support, for diffuse support. It matters for legitimacy. Uh, and that, I think that's important, although maybe not so surprising that, you know, because the re diffuse support is an attitude in people's heads, and so are values. And so something inside their head is influencing another thing inside their head is maybe not too surprising. Uh, I have created a regression, and this is the, the boiled down version of a very, very complicated analysis in which I've created a regression analysis in which the measure of diffuse regime support is the dependent variable. In this case, our form of government is best for us, and you have to do the regression eight times, one for each country. So you'll get a different N and a different adjusted R for each country the adjusted R being a measure of the fit of the model. And what we, and then I've fed into it about eight variables like sex, all the ones you've seen before, education, but I'm only showing you the uh, standardized regression coefficient for the performance variables and the culture variables. And what we see is that the culture variables are, um, um, are very important. So in eight countries, democratic values had a statistically significant effect on saying our form of government is best for us, eight out of eight. Seven out of eight countries, it was the traditional values were statistically significant. In two countries, democratic performance was significant, and in zero countries was policy performance significant for that particular dependent variable. The Bold face shows a high level of statistical significance and the, uh, the uh, size of the coefficient is the size. And what I guess I would draw your attention to in the time remaining, which is probably zero, is again that the signs are the opposite uh, on this particular question. Now you have to go through each dependent variable to ask how it works. But in this first question, which is my favorite one for measuring diffuse regime support, the tr people with stronger traditional social values generally were more dubious uh, about that. 
and the people with, uh, with um, stronger democratic values were more positive. Now, what we want to do in the, uh, uh, when you read the paper, because I can't do it now, is to f hook this back to China. You look at the China case. Well, the China case is quite interesting in comparative perspective in that the culture variables are significant uh, quite often, but they are not as high a level of statistical significance or as strong a regression coefficient as a lot of the other countries, which basically says that high regime support in China is due to something has other things, of course it's generally very high, so it doesn't show that much variance to begin with, but that culture is not the answer, and neither is performance. They are parts of the answer, but other things are operating. So, and I don't know what they are yet, maybe propaganda, maybe nationalism, I think. But we can also draw one more conclusion about China, which is from the uh, um, negative sign on democratic values for uh, here, for satisfaction with how democracy works, and the negative sign on China for trust in government institutions, and the negative sign on optimism about the future, which is to say that if modernization proceeds the way that one of our earlier tables suggested that it should, people get more educated, more income, and they lose their traditional values and gain more democratic values, this will undermine diffuse support for the Chinese regime over perhaps a very, very long period of time. But as I agree with Ed that the regime is very resourceful and just because there's some diminution in its diffuse support does not at all mean that the Chinese regime will disappear.